Good. I'm glad you can hear. Great. So we're up to 460 participants in so far. Lovely. And climbing. Would you like to launch the poll? Um, Laura, we've got a little poll for you to uh, respond to just so that we can get a sense of who's here, where you are, um, whether you're parents, practitioners, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's welcome. All right, as you're joining, those of you who are just joining, take our poll if you feel like it. We're up to 512 now. Hi, Fran. Nice to see you. I'm going to ask if this is going to be recorded, and it is, and we will be sending a link out later in the week. Yeah, we're going to record it and send out a link. We're going to put it on YouTube eventually. And we figured out how. Hi Sue. I see comments popping up really fast. Hi Shell. Sorry if I miss you, if you say hello. There some, these are going so fast I can't reply to all of them I'm afraid. All right. No, we aren't slowing down yet. I'm going to start when we slow down, um, but we're still going quite fast in terms of people joining the call. So let's. Oh, people are all over the place, everywhere. They're coming from everywhere. <laughs> Fabulous. Yes, everybody's on mute except for me which is a nice, powerful situation to be in. <laughs> hi, everybody saying hi, thanks very much. Fill out the poll if you can see it. Um, we'll give you a few housekeeping tips in a minute about how the quick Q&A is gonna run. All right, are we slowing down? We're up to 570, maybe. Maybe we're slowing down now. 572. 73. No, still going. Not stopped yet. Well, 95 comments in the chat, my goodness. Oh, somebody from Quebec. Hello, nice to see you from Quebec. Hello from Dublin. From Croatia, hello from Croatia. Another one from Canada. Fabulous, right, we're, oh, we're at 593. Is that it? Are we gonna stop at 593? 595, it's like an auction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think this is slowing down now, so I am going to get ready to start. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, if um, you want to fill out the chat, uh, the, uh, the chat, if you want to fill out the poll, please go ahead and do so. We're going to share the results at the end um, so that you can see who was here. And uh, right, we're at 600 and some, but I'm going to get started. Otherwise, we're not going to have enough time to get through everything we want to get through. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. All right, I'm assuming that you can all see this. Um, I have to move it a second because it's getting covered up by the poll. Right, okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna be talking this morning, afternoon, it's this afternoon here, um, about what's new in infant sleep safety. Um, please feel free if any comments that you want to respond to things that I'm talking about, feel free to put them in the chat. There's also a Q and A function 
um, where you can post your questions that we will be talking about after I've done my brief blurb, which is going to go on for about a half an hour, maybe. Um, you can also vote for other people's questions. So if you want to kind of upvote a question so that it gets to the top of the list, click the like button um, and any questions that you want to ask that haven't already been asked, type them in the box. Okay, everybody, I've got some helpers here who are going to be monitoring the chat in case any of you are having problems, need any assistance, or just um, uh, want a bit more discussion about something. Um, but we are going to get started then, talking about what is new in infant sleep safety. Right, so our question really to start with is why we have infant sleep safety information. Why do we give parents guidance about infant sleep safety? And the answer to that is basically that 300 babies a year still die in the UK suddenly and unexpectedly. And most of these deaths happen when those babies are asleep. Those babies tend to be under six months of age. And some of those deaths, about 100 a year, are uh, accidents, which might include suffocation, entrapment or overheating. Um, and some of them have no clear explanation. So a little under 200 a year um, don't have an explanation after a full post-mortem and death scene investigation, et cetera. And those are designated as sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. And typically nowadays, the deaths of babies occur in the presence of multiple risks. However, most of the deaths are also preventable because we know what these risks are and we know how to help parents avoid them. So this is why we have infant sleep safety info to try and prevent these deaths from occurring. In terms of what this info involves and where it comes from, um, those of you who are old enough to remember 30 years ago, SUDI rates were extremely high. They were over uh, two to a thousand, approaching two and a half per thousand in this country. Um, and the guidance that was issued around things like back to sleep, putting babies on their backs to sleep, helped precipitate a dramatic drop in sudden unexpected deaths in infancy over the last 20 years or so. And then we've had slow, gradual decreases um, over time since then. And one of, the re one of the things that is a consequence of having um, prevented some of these deaths um, and reduced the rates is that today's parents now have a lower awareness of sudden unexpected deaths in infancy than we did 30 years ago. So people tend not to know somebody who's lost a baby, whereas, you know, when I was a, a child and teenager, I knew several people in our local area who had lost babies. So there's less awareness around SUDI than there was. And sleep safety guidance not only has to help parents understand what the risks are that can help them avoid um, sudden unexpected death, but they, they need to be aware of the fact that it's a thing. So one of the things we have to do is persuade them that, that these risks are real and these deaths do happen if we don't um, think about infant sleep safety. In terms of where it comes from, then the evidence that underpins the guidance is, is the result of national and international studies that compare case series of babies who died with matched cohorts of babies who didn't die and looked at what the differences were in the infant care practices. Comparisons um, that are made can only be as detailed as the data that's been collected, which means we can't answer very fine grained questions about the circumstances of death. They're fairly broad categories, um, but however, a national child mod mortality database has recently been established in England, so that's going to facilitate us being able to answer more questions about the very specific circumstances in which babies die suddenly and unexpectedly, because we're now going to have a single source of information about the circumstances of all of those deaths, which we've never actually had before. So a quick recap then on the key points of our current UK Safe Asleep guidance. One thing that I meant to say in the previous slide is that the evidence that the UK guidance is based on is the UK data. So it's specific to um, the circumstances in the UK and in other countries, other risks might be more prominent, um, but this is what the UK guidance says at the moment. So a message that we're been long familiar with is back to sleep. 
And one of the reasons um, it's important that babies are placed on their backs to sleep is because small babies, as we know, have very heavy heads and weak necks. And when placed on their fronts, they can get stuck in a position where their airways are blocked by soft surfaces, the mattress that they're on or whatever they've been placed on to sleep, and that compromises their ability um, uh, to breathe. So putting babies on their backs to sleep is one of the things that has... Um, has reduced sudden unexpected deaths dramatically. It also prevents babies from overheating um, and rebreathing their own carbon dioxide. So there are numerous reasons for doing it. Babies should be placed. The recommendation is to place babies on a clear flat surface, free of pillows, cushions, duvets, loose blankets, soft toys, etc., because all of these things can both insulate around a baby's head and face and can cause suffocation. Um, so no hats indoors, babies lose heat from their heads. So again, that's an overheating risk. So that's why that is advised. Babies shouldn't sleep by themselves. So there's an increased chance of babies dying if they're in a, a sleep space all alone. So between zero to six months in the nighttime, it's recommended that babies should be in their parents' room and during the daytime, wherever their parent or carer is present. So somebody is, is monitoring them uh, throughout the day and night, and that they should be smoke-free. Exposure to cigarette smoke um, before and after birth increases the chance of SIDS. So babies who've been smoke exposed find it harder to wake. They have a blunted arousal response, as do babies who are put down prone, actually, on their fronts. Um, and so they don't gasp for breath when their airways are blocked or covered. We need to um, think about protecting baby's airways during sleep generally in other sleeping um, environments. So when babies are sleeping on a parent's chest, which is you know, a very common practice, it's important that the adult that they're sleeping on is awake, is able to monitor um, the baby's breathing, that the baby's face is turned to one side, uh, that their chin is up so that their um, windpipe isn't kinked. Um, and also that the adult needs to be awake so that they're able to hold the baby in place. The baby can't slide off. And that sometimes happens when parents fall asleep with babies on their chests. Babies end up face down in sofa cushions, etc. Car seats and bouncers are also another recent thing that have been um, identified as an unsafe place for babies to sleep in in the home. So Car seats are particularly an issue because of the angle that babies are forced into when car seats are placed on the floor. So when they're in um, a car, the seat of cars slopes backwards and car seats tilt backwards. Um, but when they're placed flat on the floor in a house, the car seat is more upright and babies end up in this chin to chest position, um, which again compromises their windpipe. Uh, so compresses it and babies um, can suffocate in that position. They can also suffocate by the straps, kind of like pressing against their necks. So car seats and bouncy seats that force babies into an upright position aren't safe for babies to sleep in. So they should be taken out and laid in on a flat surface. And the same thing can happen with some slings if the ticks guidance isn't followed. So slings and wraps need to be tight um, and the baby needs to be in a chin off the chest position with their back supported, that helps them to kind of keep their airways clear and their head turned to one side. So um, in terms of what the guidance tells us, um, those are the things that uh, currently are emphasized in the UK. Um, we're just gonna have a quick look at the um, results of the polls. Um, so we have 84% of you um, on the call from the UK, 12% from Europe. Um, most people work with parents. Uh, some people are parents, presumably. Um, how much do you know about sleep safety? Everybody knows, almost everybody knows a little bit. Uh, quite a bit is the uh, most prevalent answer and some people know a lot, excellent. Um, some of you have been to one of our events before, but the majority of you haven't. So welcome, thanks for coming. It's really nice to have you here. And, um, some people here are obviously parents and have a baby under a year old, but the majority don't. So presumably you are working with parents. Great. Thanks very much, Laura, for sharing that. If we think then about 
what babies need from our kind of anthropological perspective here at Durham. We always talk about the, the fact that babies need to be fed regularly, they need comfort and contact, and they need uh, adults to provide them with a safe uh, place to be. They need to be fed often, day and night, and that means that they sleep for short sessions both day and night. They also don't have a circadian rhythm uh, until they're about, they start to get one when they're about three months old. Um, so that means that they're waking day and night, and that can be difficult for parents to cope with. So what parents need is understanding about the fact that uh, caring for a baby can be difficult and that sleep disruption that a baby brings can be exhausting, um, as can night feeding, frequent night feeding. So the it had been um, discussed um, by a lot of um, parent um, focus groups and um, research conducted into how parents were using and responding to previous safe asleep guidance, um, that they needed support and guidance that kind of acknowledged the way babies sleep and the exhaustion and difficulties that parents can face at night. So the, the guidance as it currently exists, the new guidance that was produced in 2018, which I'm going to talk to you about a bit more, is um, emphasizes taking a flexible approach to helping parents figure out what works for them at night um, or with baby sleep generally, whether it's day or night, a focus on risk minimization. Um, that is, what can they do that reduces the risk as much as they are able to, rather than a very rigid risk elimination approach, which is something that we used to uh, have in this country um, that just involved telling parents what to do and what not to do. Um, and encouraging parents to make informed choices about which of these things are the most important in the circumstances in which they're operating um, and how to prioritize um, reducing the, the main risks for them. So um, the ways in which we can do this are to be open in our discussions with parents about infant care practices. Um, families and friends can offer practical support um, they can encourage normalized discussions about what is normal for infant sleep. Um, they can help parents by providing them with opportunities to nap or by helping with daily tasks um, and providing general support to help parents get through this period of exhaustion. Health professionals um, can help parents by giving them explanations about the guidance that's given around infant sleeping so that they understand why some of this, these things are important or which ones are most important in their situation. So tailoring the information to the circumstances of the parents that we're talking to and providing them with clear advice that comes from trusted sources. In terms of what's new then in infant sleep safety, and really we're um, talking about the guidance that was produced in 2018, um, that was a combination of the Lullaby Trust, uh, BASIS ourselves, and um, UNICEF Baby Friendly and endorsed by um, Public Health England, which has now also been rolled out in Scotland um, and endorsed by the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland in 2022. And in this new guidance, which is called Safe Asleep um, for Babies, this, we, we emphasise um, some, some new things really. Um, one of the things that we don't say anymore is the safest place for a baby to sleep is in a cot by your bed. Um, as I mentioned, we emphasize a clear flat sleep space that babies should be close to caregivers daytime and nighttime. And um, there are several reasons for this. One is that, um, as I said, many parents um, were interpreting the guidance to put your baby in a cot by your bed as that was where the baby should sleep during the day as well as during the night and that's not the case. Babies are safest where their uh, carers are. Um, many parents don't have a cot in their living room so saying that the baby should be in a cot meant again that they were putting them upstairs um, and the idea that babies all babies sleep in cots reflects certain assumptions middle about sort of white middle class lifestyles um, that alienated some parents. Um, so any flat, um, clear sleep space, any receptacle that provides a clear flat sleep space 
um, uh, is a safe place for a baby to sleep. We also no longer say never share a bed with your baby. Um, we've modified this message to emphasize that bed sharing is normal. It's a normal part of coping with nighttime infant sleep. Many parents bring their babies into bed with them regularly. Some bring them in occasionally. Um, it might be called bed sharing, it might be called co-sleeping. People might not think that they're bed sharers if they only do it occasionally. Um, but we, it's important that we acknowledge that sleeping with a baby is something that 50% of parents with babies under three months do. A fifth of babies are in their parents' bed on any one night in the UK. And this might be an intended practice or it might be an un unintentional or accidental practice. And therefore, it's important that all families have information about safe bed sharing because the majority of them will do it at some point, whether they intend to or not. They might find themselves in a situation where it's their only choice, it's the only way they can get their baby to sleep, or they're away from home and they don't have another safe place to put their baby. So bed sharing is also a common practice and it's, it's practiced for a number of different reasons. It might be to soothe or settle the baby. It might be to make breastfeeding more manageable at night. It might be because the parents have no space or funds to get a cot or a Moses basket. It might be because they're trying to get more sleep. They want to be close to their baby. They might feel it helps with their baby. Or it might be because it's a culturally normal practice. Can't assume that parents are, are, are bed sharing with their baby for any, any single reason. And it's a reason why we need to speak to all parents about it. We know that some bed sharing is hazardous and parents need to know which circumstances these are. So uh, the new UK guidance, as I've said, encourages informed decision-making particularly to make sure that parents are aware that sleeping with their baby on a sofa or an armchair is um, one of those places where there is a high chance of babies dying, one in seven, 174. Um, also sleeping with their baby after consuming drugs and alcohol. These sorts of circumstances come up again and again in the infant death reviews. Parent, when the parent is a smoker, this also increases the risk, as does sleeping with a baby who was born prematurely. Safer bed sharing, then, is not something that has been part of the SIDS guidance um, in the UK uh, for many years, and it's still not part of the guidance in a lot of countries. But here, we are now talking to parents about what makes safer bed sharing safer. So we're helping parents to understand that, again, the baby needs to be in a clear, flat space. Um, so away from the pillows, for parents to be aware of whether there are gaps around their bed that babies can fall into, um, that there should be no pets and no other children on the bed, and that the, the mother or carer who is sleeping with the baby should be aware of making a space with their body to sleep, for the baby to sleep in, curling up around the baby to keep the baby away from the pillows with their arm above the head, not in, uh, able to move down the bed under the covers with their knees under the feet, monitoring the baby throughout the night, making sure the baby is on their back and keeping the covers well away from the baby's uh, face and head. And it's important that we talk about bed sharing with parents when we're talking about safe asleep, because when parents were told never to bed share, numerous things happened. And this has been highlighted in numerous uh, research studies and focus groups over the past years. Parents who were told never to bed share engaged in riskier behaviors. They thought that they had to take their baby out of their bed and go and feed them downstairs on a sofa during the night. And if they accidentally fell asleep there, that was much riskier than if they'd stayed in bed. Parents were afraid to discuss bed sharing with health professionals because um, they felt they were going to get told off during the era of never bed sharing guidance. So they didn't get information about how to do it as safely as possible if it was something they'd chosen to do or they had to do because they had no option. Um, and parents were unable to plan ahead. Uh, to think about how to make their bed safe on the, for those occasions when they might end up uh, bringing their baby into bed. So the new UK guidance then emphasizes 
telling parents about how to do it as safely as possible, it being bed sharing, how to bed share as safely as possible, and the circumstances to try and avoid um, because they're associated with the most uh, biggest risks. So what's important really is that we talk to parents about bed sharing um, and we don't avoid having those discussions. So one of the things then that that leads into is that the new infant sleep safety uh, guidance in the UK encourages informed decision making and open discussion of risks, whether those are bed sharing risks or other kinds of risks. Um, parents are encouraged to think about and health professionals to help them think about what they would do under certain risky scenarios. So what would happen if, what would happen if um, your husband bought a friend home who uh, lit up a cigarette in your house? What would happen if um, you were going out for the night and you were leaving your baby in the care of a relative? What would you do? How would you make sure that that baby um, was looked after in an appropriate way and the, pet, the, the carer knew about the safe sleep guidance? So some risks that we might want to think about talking to parents about then are illustrated in the next couple of slides. So here's uh, the, the one I was just talking about. A is um, uh, grandpa's looking after the baby, um, is put the baby face down, doesn't know that it's important to put the baby on their back. So put the baby face down on the sofa and he's also fallen asleep himself. So um, the baby's in a compromised position by being face down on the sofa in the first place, but then if he keels over in his sleep, he could end up suffocating her as well. So, it, you know, some important messages to, um, to emphasize there. Second one is a baby who's been born into bed in the morning. So the mum can get a bit of extra sleep um, placed on a pillow. Um, so this mum needs information about if she's bringing the baby into bed, putting it flat on, on the mattress, on its back, well away from the pillows, etc. And the third one illustrates um, some of the products that are available on the market. Um, to encourage um, babies to sleep or sleep longer or prevent colic and things like this. There's no regulation of these kinds of products. So parents might need to be aware of the fact that they're the ones who have to decide whether a, a particular product that they buy is safe for their baby, but products that encourage parents to put their baby's face down should be avoided. Um, same with... Um, Cute pictures that often circulate on the internet um, of babies sleeping with soft toys. It might look cute and cuddly, but having a soft toy of any kind in a baby's sleep environment, never mind using one as a pillow, um, increases the risk of suffocation as well as um, sudden infant death. And one of the products that often come up in discussions are sleep pods and sleep nests. One of the reasons these are advised against is because it's basically like a big cushion that, that um, surrounds the baby. And if we're advising against any kind of soft cushiony surfaces and products, um, then these fall into that category. But they could also, um, because babies often sleep at the top of them with their heads pressed against the cushions, that can be an overheating risk. If parents are encouraged to look at the manufacturer's instructions for many of these pods and nests, they say that babies shouldn't be left to sleep in them unattended. Um, so if parents are going, so one of the risk minimization approaches might be to talk to parents about the fact that if they've got one and they want to use it, then the baby should only sleep in it when somebody is, is monitoring them. Um, but putting them in the baby's cot and allowing using them like a cot reducer and allowing the baby to sleep in them all night while the parents are asleep is, is not considered safe practice. And F is the car seats in the house, so the bouncy chairs that force babies into an upright position for sleeping. Um, we've mentioned those already, but think, help parents think about their baby's airways and their windpipes getting kinked and blocked and being unable to breathe. Um, in this situation, a baby's head is too heavy for them to be able to lift it up um, and gasp. So this is one of those circumstances where accidental deaths can happen. All right. Um, and then that was thinking about universal provision, the guidance that we give to all families. But we also need to recognize that there are some families that need more help and support 
uh, than the universal guidance offers. And it's uh, therefore um, important we recognize that SUDI now in this country is inequitable. It clusters amongst the most impoverished and vulnerable families. Um, so while universal guidance is given before and after birth to all families, or it should be, um, there are some families who don't engage with antenatal care or health visitor appointments, so they don't get that information. Sometimes um, they might forget the safe asleep information they've been given, or it might have been too complex for them to understand. They forget to tell their partners or other carers in some instances, or they're in circumstances where they're not able to implement the guidance because of lack of resources or temporary living arrangements or disruptions that are happening or other family circumstances. So um, in terms of in, in, inequities then, some families need more support and more guidance than others. And the National Child Safeguarding Review that was published in 2020 gives us some um, tips and hints about who these families are and what kind of support they might need. So this review um, examined 40 cases of infant deaths uh, that happened in 2018 and referred to this panel. And almost all of those cases involved a combination of the following. They involved co-sleeping in unsafe environments, parental consumption of alcohol and drugs, a history of cumulative neglect of children in the family, domestic violence in the family, parent mental health concerns and substance misuse. So the majority of deaths of babies that are occurring in the UK now are actually known to services. Um, and these are the families that need extra and added targeted support above and beyond universal provision. Of the 40 babies who died in this review, 63 of them were under six, uh, three months of age, but there was a peak at one month, which means it's the youngest babies that are the most vulnerable in this situation. Um, previously, the peak for SIDS has been between uh, two and three months. Um, so with a peak at one month, it means, you know, um, we have to get in there really quick to provide support um, in these very vulnerable families. Uh, there wasn't any predominance of any particular um, ethnic uh, ethnicity or um, uh, group background um, that was spread across, you know, a variety of ethnicities and white British families. Ten of the cases were living in poor housing with overcrowding, and some of the cases um, involved unrecognised childhood adversity for the parents. So these are things that we might want to be thinking about when we're supporting particularly vulnerable families. And there were particular situational risks that occurred that um, caused disruptions to normal routines um, in most of these cases that meant that families, for whatever reason, were unable to engage effectively with safer sleeping advice. So we need to be uh, taking new approaches, really, to think it's not just about information giving when it comes to targeted support anymore. It's about thinking about the circumstances in which families are housed, the vulnerabilities and the support that they're receiving, um, and you know, making sure that everybody's aware of, that those babies are at increased risk. So let's have a think as a, as a group about what some of the things are that we can do, um, both for universal provision to help people understand why we have safer sleep guidance and to understand you know, what are the things that they need to be prioritizing in their own um, particular circumstances, but also what are the ways in which we can help support vulnerable families um, who need extra targeted support. So some of the things that we can do is have discussions with parents about um, infant sleep, what it's like, how to normalize, um, how people think about infant sleep and frequent night waking, we can help direct people to credible resources. We can use these to support and inform new parents, and we can help them be um, a bit critical about everything that they see in the shops and in social media. So feel free to share your ideas in the chat. I'm going to stop talking now because I think I've been doing that for about half an hour. Um, and we're going to have a look at some of your questions and comments and see how many we can get through uh, to find out um, what you'd like to know. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. 
Alrighty. And I think I'm going to ask my lovely assistants here to help me with the questions. So I'm going to try and filter them so that you can see open ones no more than four or five at a time. That would be helpful. And then as you go through them, I'll add more. Okay, then. Can do. Great. Okay, so uh, Victoria asks, can you talk about sleepy heads or pods? Are they okay for supervised sleep? So I think we've answered that one. Um, yes, they're okay for supervised sleep, so long as parents know what the risks are associated with them, um, but not for unsupervised sleep. Um, and, um, you know, it's better for the baby's sleep environment to be clear and flat. But if we're talking about informed choices, you know, parents have the uh, option to, to choose to use them, um, but they should know what the issues are around them. Okay. Do we have any information on vape smoking and babies? Unfortunately, we don't. So none of the case control studies that have looked at um, vaping, uh, who have looked at SIDS have collected enough information on vaping. They're, it's too new, basically, for there to be any data on whether babies were exposed to, to vape smoking. So that's one of those questions that we hope the National Mortality Database might be able to answer in the near future. Um, top tips around safe asleep and cold homes. Yes, the Lullaby Trust has just come out with some guidance for um, safe asleep during the coming winter because, um, you know, everyone's aware about the energy crisis and people uh, keeping their heating down, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, please have a look at that link, which is specifically about um, safe asleep in uh, cold, cold homes. Um, huge increase in video monitors, and these are often used for babies being in different rooms. What is the recommendation on this? Okay, this is an, a, a good question. Um, video monitors don't stop babies from dying. So parents aren't watching the monitor all the time. Um, they can, they can prevent anxiety, they can help with parents' anxiety. The same goes for other kinds of monitors, not just video monitors, but the physiological monitors, the the mats that you put under the baby that sets off an alarm. They're good for helping um, reduce anxiety, particularly in families where there might have been a previous infant death. Um, but they, it's, it's not the presence of a video monitor that keeps the baby safe any more than it's the presence of the cop being by the parent's bed. It's the parent. It's the, the physical presence of a parent that keeps babies safe. So, um, um, yeah, um, I wouldn't recommend a video monitor as a safe sleep device. Um, if a baby is under six months old and using a dummy, and this is falling out and causing wakes every hour, are parents to remove the dummy or shall they keep for six months? That's an interesting question and not one that I think I've had to answer before, but the, the general <clears throat> the general guidance around dummies is that if a baby usually uses one, not having it is associated with an increased chance of SIDS. Excuse me. Talking too much. Um, so if they normally have a dummy, it's best to give them a dummy for every sleep. Um, but if they don't normally use a dummy, then um, there's no guidance in this country that you they should use one. If it keeps falling out, I would say um, let it fall out. Um, causing wakes every hour um, might not be to do with a dummy falling out. It might be to do with something else. So um, I would say keep using the dummy for the first six months because that's the current guidance, but it's the parent's choice. So if they want to make an informed choice to remove the dummy and see if that helps the baby keep sleeping, that that is for them to decide in a you know a discussion with somebody um, who will help them think about what the what the alternatives might be. I don't think there's any easy answer to that one, to be honest. Um, has there been any update to guidance on research around premature babies and bed sharing? Um, Somewhat answered in the slide, some, some bed sharing is hazardous as there's insufficient research, yes. So premature babies is something that we get asked about a lot. And the problem there is that you have, you know, there's, there's, there's not a single kind of premature baby. They might be born at all different kinds of ages and they might have experienced all kinds of different complications. Um, 
And then it's unclear if there's an age at which premature babies cease to be vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable than term babies. So it's very difficult to give a kind of cutoff point as to when it might or might not be safe to bring a premature baby into bed. Some parents of premature babies, you know, are very keen to breastfeeding them, breastfeed them as much as um, as they can to reestablish, you know, establish breastfeeding and want to have their baby close in bed. Um, but it it's important that they know that it is an increased risk. Um, yeah, difficult, difficult question to answer. If it's a late preterm baby, the answer might be different than if it was a very preterm baby, etc. So parents need to kind of use their judgment in that situation. Uh, the slide which showed the rates from uh, 19, hang on, 1984 to 2016, yeah, there was a big drop in the 80s probably due to smoking cessation awareness of smoke around babies, back to sleep wasn't till the early 90s, okay, and it took a while to filter through. Side sleeping, still popular and common. Why the focus on back sleeping for reducing rates when it seems other factors are more or as important? Um, one of the reasons for the focus on back sleeping is because if people start putting their babies on their fronts again, um, the rates are, are very likely to start increasing. Um, and because um, it did, you know, it, it, it was putting babies on their fronts was recommended um, at one point in the kind of like um, 60s and 70s, etc. And a lot of babies died because of that recommendation. Um, so when it became clear, it took several years after it became clear that this was an increased risk for it to get um, part of the national guidance or for national guidance to even be produced on uh, reducing the, the um, risk of SIDS. Um, so the thing about the side sleeping is that it's an unstable position when babies are sleeping by themselves. Um, so babies who are put on their sides are found prone when they die, when they're dead. Um, so, you know, having a, having a clear message about putting babies on their backs um, makes it unambiguous. So we don't recommend side sleeping in the UK, um, only back sleeping. What is the reason for sleeping in the same room? It appears to be about infant arousal and a lot of these things are about infant arousal, that babies who are placed prone, babies who are smoke exposed in pregnancy, babies who sleep alone, have blunted arousal responses. They're less likely to arouse um, to a physiological challenge. So it's, it's about babies being aware that their parents are there, the noise and the movement of the, the parents keeps the baby in lighter phases of sleep. They're more likely to arouse if there's a physiological challenge. Um, with safe co-sleeping, oh, I've lost the safe co-sleeping, oh, there it is. Is there any difference if the baby is bottle fed or breastfed? The guidance is actually the same now. We used to mostly give that guidance to breastfeeding mothers because they were a group who we knew regularly brought their babies into bed with them. Um, but in the UK now, we give that guidance to all mothers. Um, and we talk to them about the way in which breastfeeding mothers sleep with their babies, which is keeps them in a safer space and, and helps to monitor them. Does swaddling make a difference? Um, there's not any clear evidence that swaddling is associated with an increase or a decrease of SIDS in this country. Um, swaddling does make a difference if babies are brought into bed. Babies shouldn't be swaddled because it can cause um, it can be an, an issue with overheating if they're also covered by some of the bed covers. But most importantly, babies need their arms and legs free to alert parents to where they are, to move covers away from them, etc. Covers do move around in the night when you're bed sharing and sometimes babies accidentally get covered. Um, and if they're swaddled, they can't do anything about it. So um, swaddling makes a difference with bed sharing, definitely, but otherwise with SIDS, um, there's no clear evidence. There was a, a review, a systematic review done a few years ago and they couldn't find any clear evidence either way. 
What about babies having to sleep in a car, et cetera, for long journeys? The guidance currently from the Lullaby Trust is that um, you should stop regularly um, and remove the baby from the, from the car seat um, periodically. Um, but remember that the car seat is tilted further backwards um, when it's in the car than it is um, when it's taken out of the car and put on the floor. So the position that the baby in shouldn't be forcing the baby's um, head onto its chest when it's in a car. Um, but still, um, it's a good idea to let babies kind of wake up periodically um, on car journeys. Um, why are there no regulations for unsafe see products. I would love to know why there are no regulations. I mean, I suppose there are some because there are regulations around cots and cot mattresses and things like that. But there are so many infant products out there. Um, and some of them come from overseas. So it's, you know, um, with with buying things on the internet now, it's really hard to kind of regulate where products are coming from and what what circumstances they've been produced under. Products for ba babies and children in the UK have to have the kite mark, um, which was part of the EU regulations as well. Um, but that only means that they have to be certified as being uh, non-flammable. Um, so, yeah, parents really need uh, the Lullaby Trust has a nice guide, actually, for um, parents to help them think about the products that they might purchase for their baby. Um, is it more the language that they're using to sell them? Yes, that is also an issue that people often use um, language around safe sleep and SIDS to, to, to try and promote their products um, when there's not really any evidence about that. Um, so yes, encourage, if you're working with parents, encourage them to be mindful of these things around products. Is smoke exposure dose dependent? Is there a difference between maternal smoking and secondhand smoke from a partner, occasional smoking versus regular? Yes, it does seem as if there is a dose dependent relationship. So maternal smoking in pregnancy is associated with the, the strongest uh, risk. Um, oh, it's, oh, there it is. Um, um, this and... and um, Second-hand smoke from a partner might cling to the partner's clothing, etc., or it might be the carbon monoxide that's being exhaled from their breath or whatever's in the tar that's in their lungs, the noxious chemicals. So, you know, the, the direct exposure um, in utero is to do with a reduction in oxygen um, and the baby being born with a, a blunted arousal response. Smoke-exposed babies are one of those groups that has a blunted arousal response. Whereas the uh, smoke exposure postnatally is more to do with the transfer of whatever uh, the circumstance, the, the, the things are about the smoke um, that are um, hazardous for babies. So smokers, for instance, are encouraged to smoke outside and to wear a smoking jacket, you know, a jacket that they wear and they take off when they come in so their clothing isn't um, contaminated and that kind of thing. What are your thoughts about using an owlet sock that helps to monitor baby's heart rate and oxygen levels? Well, um, the ki those kinds of devices, I think, put a monitor in between the parent and their baby. And personally, I would rather parents be monitoring their baby than having a device monitoring their baby. Um, so, uh, you know, again, they're one of these kinds of reassurance devices uh, rather than SIDS prevention devices. They're not going to stop the baby dying. Uh, the parent's going to be watching their phone up 24 seven. Um, yeah. Um, so those are my thoughts about it. All right. That was what I was asked. Um, many newborns. Oh, I have I missed one? Oh, I have missed one. Sorry. Um, they do go up and down. How do other cultures around the world where parental proximity is more the norm and bed sharing is approach sleep safety and what makes it successful more risky than in the UK? Um, well, there's numerous um, studies have looked at SIDS in different cultures around the world. I mean, we need to remember that in some societies, there are other things that are killing babies much more prominently than uh, SIDS. So people may not know what the actual rate of SIDS are in some circumstances. Um, but in other kind of like 
well-off, economically well-off countries like Japan and Korea, for instance, um, their sleep environments might be different. So they might be sleeping on um, futons that are firmer um, than Western beds. Um, their breastfeeding rates might be higher. Their smoking amongst mothers might not be as prevalent. Um, you know, alcohol consumption is a big issue in the UK. Um, people might not binge drink as much as they do in the UK in other cultures. So there are various things about both infant care practices and the behavior of new parents or new mothers generally um, that can make a difference. Um, and there are some of the re some of the things that, that make the UK different. What are your views on sleeping bags you can use instead of blankets? Um, is there any research around the use of these? There's not a lot of research around the use of them, um, but they do um, prevent babies from getting uh, covered by loose bedding. So that's one of their big advantages. Um, they have to be well fitting though for that to, um, for that to um, work. So they, they babies need to not be in an oversized sleeping bag that they can slide down inside. Um, so the general consensus is that sleeping bags or um, lightweight blankets um, that are tucked in at the bottom of the cot, uh, feet to foot, are the two best options. Is breastfeeding no longer considered protective against SIDS or is it just that the info is the same for both breastfeeders and formula feeders? Yes, breastfeeding is protective. Um, so um, the, the Safer Sleep for Babies guidance uh, one of the key messages is that breastfeeding reduces SIDS and um, the latest meta-analysis shows that it's um, if babies are breastfed for at least two months, um, it at least halves the risk of SIDS. Um, but specifically when we're talking about bed sharing, we as a, as a national kind of guidance group um, decided that it was important that all parents have information about safe bed sharing, not just breastfeeders, because the prevalence of bed sharing is quite high um, in non-breastfeeders as well, at least occasional and accidental bed sharing, and they need that information. Um, so that's why it's, it's targeted for everybody. Right, that was a quick rapid fire question and answer session. Laura, what would you like me to do now? And we could open it to the floor where people can raise their hand to ask questions if you want to go back that way, because I'm aware that when we use the Q&A, there are things being asked multiple times in multiple different ways, and I'm thinking of getting lost. So there might be some nuanced questions that you haven't captured. Yes, go ahead. For the last five minutes, let's open the floor and let people ask questions, whoever is quick on the drawer and can get their hand up. So if you've got a question we haven't talked about yet. Can you see you want me to do that? I can't see. Okay. No, you do it. I'm going to pick on Lisa Joyce, who's at the top of my screen. So Lisa, if you would like to unmute yourself, you can ask a question. Hi. Hi, Helen. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thanks for that. That's been brilliant. Um, my question is, it relates to the Lullaby Trust, actually. Um, will their advice um, around bed sharing be changing? Will they be updating their advice in line with um, the information you've shared today? Um, well, the, the information that I've shared today is in the, the joint guidance that the Lullaby Trust, UNICEF, BASIS, NHS Scotland, Public Health England, um, um, all give out. So yeah, um, I think it's already changed. There might be a few old things kicking about on the website that haven't been updated, but as far as I know, Lullaby Trust is on board with everything that I've said today. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, I'm now going to call on Yvonne Connolly. Hi Yvonne. Hello, hi, thank you um, for this. This has really, really um, been really beneficial. Um, my question is about kind of mattress toppers and how firm a parent's mattress should be. So mm -hmm. we've been told that it should be, um, if you're bed sharing, it should be on a firm mattress. Mm -hmm. But how would parents know how firm their mattress should be? And what else um, they might want to know if it should be memory phone or sprung? 
Um, and what if they use a mattress topper? Okay, so there isn't, there are, it's, this is one of those things that hasn't come up in case control studies. There hasn't been enough in um, babies dying in circumstances that involve mattress toppers and, and, and that kind of stuff. But the general common sense rule uh, of thumb is that if the baby's head, or if you put the baby on the mattress and the baby's head sinks into the mattress or mattress topper by more than a few millimeters, then it's too soft because if the baby accidentally ended up face down, that would completely surround its nose and mouth. So that's what they need to be thinking about. Right, okie dokie, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> somebody called Brilliant Baby Rearing Business. Hello, Brilliant. Are you going to ask a question? Maybe not. Brilliant baby wearing, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? I think maybe not. Let's maybe they can't. To, um, Noreen Garner. Hi, Noreen. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, Helen. I was. I was just going to ask you in relation to the NICE guidance where mm -hmm. the latest guidance talks about alcohol, about not co-sleeping with your baby if you've drunk two or more units of alcohol. Um, just really what you think about that. Personally, it, it made me nervous mm -hmm. um, because I think it's very hard for any of us to pour exactly one unit of alcohol at any time in our house. Um, but I, I know when I look at the uh, the leaflets out there, it doesn't tend to say that. It still says have drunk alcohol. I don't know mm -hmm. what you think. I, I personally, I think um, uh, you know it's a clearer message to to just say don't drink alcohol, don't sleep with your baby if you've drunk any alcohol, um, because as you say, judging how much you've had can be quite difficult. Uh, I think the two units just came from the kind of standard, if it's an unsafe to drive with two units, yeah. it's unsafe to sleep with a baby. Um, but again, you know, even with driving, um, it's probably better if people haven't drunk anything. So I, you know, I would, I would err on the side of caution and say, you know, no, no alcohol if you're sleeping with a baby, it does affect your sleep and it affects your awareness, so any amount. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have time for one more? Or is that the last one? Oh, I'll just, I, I can see brilliant baby wearing said her uh, microphone chat and it failed. So she's put a question in the chat. It was to say, guidance on sleep focuses on infants and many parents struggle with their own sleep and to get parents to look at solutions for their own sleep rather than their baby. Yep, I completely agree with you on that. It might not be that there's a problem with, uh, with Zoe. Okay, it might not be a, that there's an issue with the baby's sleep. It might be the parents. Yeah. All right, I think we need to wrap up. It is now half past one. We promised that we were gonna um, be online till half past one. So I am going to Thank you all very much for joining us. It has been great to have you here. Um, thank you to ESRC Festival of Social Science for funding this event. Um, they've made it possible. We're gonna put the recording of this event on our YouTube channel um, and we'll send you out the link for it. Those of you, um, well, if you weren't here, you don't know that I'm saying this, but we're gonna put the link for it on our YouTube channel. So those who weren't here will be able to access it later. Thanks everyone, have a good day, take care and spread all the, your new knowledge. Bye.